Hi guys, welcome back to Room Org TV. I'm executive editor Andrea Subasati, and issue 188 is on stands now, the May-June issue. It's also available at ru-morg.com. We've got a cover story on Nosferatu, the upcoming AMC series based on the Joe Hill novel. We've also got a feature on Brightburn, an upcoming superhero horror movie, and Gura Theater, which is a Japanese guerrilla horror theater movement that I didn't know anything about until we ran this feature. And also something on Blood and Black Wax, which is an upcoming book that Rumorg is putting out with 1984 Publishing. So be sure to check that out, enjoy the episode, and we'll see you next time. I'm Rumorg staff writer Sean Plummer, and you're watching Rumorg TV. So a couple of years ago, I wrote a story on Anton LaVey for Rumorg. Anton LaVey was the founder of the Church of Satan. He passed away in 1998. And so this got me thinking about Satan. I'm kind of a dilettante when it comes to everything Satan now. It interests me. And there's a new documentary coming out May 3rd in Canada called Hail Satan with a question mark. Um, and a lot of documentaries I find use film clips to make their points, um, including Hail Satan, which has clips from movies like Black Sunday, Haxon, The Devil's Reign, Rosemary's Baby, as well as those awful satanic panic videos that came out in the 80s and 90s produced by various police organizations and religious groups. These symbols of Satanism are turning up everywhere. On walls, on clothes, on album covers, and even on bodies of murder victims. And so this got me thinking about Satan as a movie character, because of course, Rumorg loves Satan movies. Now, we know about all the usual Satans. Al Pacino as John Milton in The Devil's Advocate. Robert De Niro as Louis Cipher, not Lucifer, Louis Cipher in Angel Heart. We know Tim Curry, he's great as Darkness and Legend, although I think that film's really boring. I'm sorry. Anyway, these are our well-known cinematic Satans, but I want to introduce you to six cinematic Satans that perhaps you didn't really know about. Number six, The Devil Rides Out. So The Devil Rides Out is based on a 1934 novel by Dennis Wheatley, and it came out in 1968. It's a Hammer film. It was directed by Terence Fisher. Great score by James Bernard, who is a, probably the go-to composer for Hammer Films. It stars Christopher Lee as the Duke de Richelieu, who's an aristocrat whose young charge, Simon Aaron, is about to undergo his satanic baptism into a cult led by the vicious Mokata, a occultist based on Alistair Crowley, who's probably better known as the Great Beast. Charles Gray plays him. You probably know him from the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And the devil in The Devil Rides Out comes into play during the set piece where Simon is about to be baptized, there's orgiastic dancing, there's the sacrifice of a goat, and then, boom, we have the goat of Mendes, or Baphomet, or as the Duke says, the devil himself appears out of thin air. Now, this version of the devil as Baphomet is probably my favorite visual look with the goat makeup, the cloven hooves, and Baphomet was played by Eddie Powell, who is, was Christopher Lee's go-to stunt performer. He also played the xenomorph in Ridley Scott's Alien in one scene in that film. This version of Baphomet is based on a illustration by Eliphas Levy, a 18th century French occultist, and Baphomet itself came to be known as a goat idol that the Knights Templar allegedly worshipped. Whether that's the case or not, we don't really know. Now, I understand that this particular Baphomet could probably look better if Rick Baker or Rob Bottin had done it, but I personally love the look, and as an aside, the Satanic Temple tried to install a Baphomet statue on the grounds of the Arkansas State Capitol, and this is a battle which we see in Hail Satan. Number five, the prophecy. Now, before he was Aragorn in the Lord of the Rings films, and before he wrestled naked in David Cronenberg's Eastern Promises, Viggo Mortensen played Lucifer 
in 1995's The Prophecy. So the film stars Canadian actor Elias Kataeus as Tommy Daggett, an LAPD detective and former seminary student who discovers that there's a war in heaven where angels loyal to God are battling angels loyal to the Archangel Gabriel. And Gabriel is played by Christopher Walken, and it's Walken's performance that probably is best remembered for the prophecy. But to my mind, Viggo Mortensen is even more memorable as Lucifer. He doesn't show up until late in the film where he approaches Virginia Madsen's school teacher character to lay out what is going on. And Mortensen can sell some of the most sinister but absolutely ridiculous dialogue that has ever been written. I think the line is something like, I can lay you out and fill your mouth with your mother's feces, or we can talk. And he can sell it because it's Vigo freaking Mortensen, feature Oscar nominee. So you've got the scene later on where Cateus is battling for the soul of this young girl and Lucifer heads off against Gabriel, takes a bite out of the man's heart, sorry, spoiler alert there, and gives this orgasmic squeal which is just disturbing as all at get out. So Vigo, you can fill my mouth with my mother's feces anytime. Just kidding, that's disgusting. I don't love you. I can't do this. I can lay you out and fill your mouth with your mother's feces, or we can talk. Number four, Constantine. Okay, look, Constantine gets shit on a lot, but I love it. I'm sorry. And there are so many criticisms. First of all, the character John Constantine comes from the comic book Hellblazer. Comic book fans, okay. They deviate from the source material, apparently. I have not read it. This is my introduction to the character. He is a blonde Englishman. When in fact, in the movie, he is a brunette American. And Keanu Reeves. Everybody hated Keanu Reeves. But I'm sorry, I bet half of those fanboys are going to John Wick 3, so fuck those guys. Anyway, so if you're not familiar with Constantine, and you should be, he plays a supernatural detective who has been forbidden from going to heaven because of a suicide attempt when he's younger. So he is able to see, because of that, demons walking the earth. And he learns of a plot whereby Gabriel, again, Gabriel, this time played by Tilda Swinton, is doing a deal with the son of Satan, Mammon, to bring him to earth to wreak havoc so that mankind can reach his and her best self. Now, this devil, this Satan, or Lou, as John calls him, because they're friends, is played by Peter Stormare. Now, you may know this Swedish actor from Fargo, where he played one of the contract killers, the one who's not Steve Buscemi, and he plays Chernobog in the American Gods TV show. Now, the look of this Satan is just uncanny. Stormare has eyebrows shaved, no sideburns to speak of, and he enters the scene wearing this immaculate white designer suit dripping with black ichor as he descends down into the scene. It's a very uncanny, weird look, and personality-wise, um, the director, Francis Lawrence, and the screenwriter, Kiva Goldsman, described him as insouciant on the commentary, which I think is absolutely correct. He's got this swagger. He doesn't have to bellow. He doesn't have to bluster because he's Lucifer. He can do as he pleases. And so given all that, I think that Peter Stormare's Lucifer is one of the most sinister, but also one of the more likable Satans to ever be put on film. Time to go. Number three, Tales from the Hood. So Tales from the Hood stars Clarence Williams the third. Um, you might know Clarence Williams from the Mod Squad, late 60s, he plays undercover detective Link Hayes, but more than likely you know him as Prince's father in Purple Rain. Clarence in this film plays Mr. Sims, this funeral home owner who is setting up a drug deal with three young gangbangers. 
and he wants to sell them the shit. The shit is re repeated ad infinitum. It's a good drinking game. Try it. You'll like it. Now where's the shit? The shit? The shit. The shit that you found. I found a whole stock of them in the alley. Whoa, 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 whoa. You get it when we get the shit. The shit. <laughs> the shit. Drugs. You get the drugs, then I get the money. Kill that noise, man. Let's just get the shit. You'll get the shit. You'll be knee deep in the shit. So, Mr. Sims, though, insists on telling stories related to the corpses in the funeral home before selling these guys the shit. Finally, though, we get to Mr. Sims' basement where he has the drugs apparently hidden in coffins. Now, you may see where this is going. It's not drugs in the coffins. It's the guys' bodies because they've been dead the whole time. And that's when things get biblical. Mr. Sims reveals himself not to be Mr. Sims, but the devil incarnate, where he basically says to them, this ain't no funeral home. It ain't no terror dome neither. Welcome to hell, motherfuckers. Anyway, the devil that Mr. Sims turns into was designed by Screaming Mad George. He's got wings, horns. It's a devil you haven't really seen before. Screaming Mad George cut his teeth on mainstream productions like Predator, but he's got this really surreal vision that you see in films like Brian Usna's Society, where he did the shunting scene, look it up. He did the cockroach transformation scene in A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master. Just really crazy stuff. But the greatest special effect in Tales from the Hood is Clarence Williams III. This guy is insane. He makes Al Pacino in The Devil's Advocate look like Clarence the Angel from It's a Wonderful Life. Um, to use hip hop terms and with all due respect to, to the Wu-Tang Clan, Mr. Sims ain't nothing to fuck with. Welcome! To hell! Number two, The Witch. Now, as a horror journalist, there's a handful of films that I can say I was legitimately scared to see them. The Blair Witch Project, Paranormal Activity, and The Witch. Now, The Witch is the stylish debut feature from writer-director Robert Eggers. It stars Anya Taylor-Joy as Thomason, the eldest daughter in a Puritan family which has moved to the woods away from their settlement because their father thinks that the settlement is far too permissive. But a witch steals the baby away from the family and everything falls apart. Now this could be a domestic drama except for the fact that there is a witch actually stalking this family. And so the figure of Satan appears in the form of Black Philip, a billy goat that we have seen be unruly throughout the film and which we've seen Thomas's younger siblings talk to. We don't know what's going on with it until towards the end, Black Philip gores Thomason's father to death and leads her into their house where she asks it to speak to her the same way that it speaks to her siblings. Off, this is all off camera with the, the camera focused on Thomason. We hear the creature ask her, what dost thou want? So it asks her, wouldst thou like the taste of butter? Wouldst thou like a pretty dress? And most famously, it asks, wouldst thou like to live deliciously? And this is a fair question. The whole point of this Puritan lifestyle is to give up what we enjoy here on earth for a life after death. But Satan is about the world. He is the king of the world. He is offering the pleasures of life. And if it's a choice between starvation and privation with the death of her family out in the forest versus a life that's lived deliciously, is there really a choice? Now we don't see Satan but we hear a figure, a black clad figure, with boot heels coming around behind Thomason to help guide her hand as she signs her name in his book. This of course being her signing away her soul. Black Philip as a goat again leads Thomason into the forest where she joins a coven of naked witches 
chanting, and they all levitate up into the air and away. Now, it's interesting that A24, the film's distributor, actually got in touch with the Satanic Temple. They arranged screenings, and it provided great publicity for both of them. The Witch went on to be a huge hit. The Satanic Temple continued to become even more popular than it already is. What's that? Finally, number one, Quatermass and the Pit. I'm excited to talk about this film because I think it's underappreciated. Um, Scream Factory is going to be putting out a Blu-ray this summer, July 30th, so pick it up when that comes out. Um, it is based on a t six-part TV serial that was broadcast in late 1958, early 1959. It was written by Nigel Neal, a very well-respected sci-fi writer, best known for the character of Quatermass. He's also made films like, or written films like The Stone Tape, as well as uh, the original draft of John Carpenter's Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. So Quatermass in the Pit stars Andrew Keir, who you may remember as the monk from Dracula, Prince of Darkness, as Professor Bernard Quatermass, a crusty but likable scientist who is called in when fragile fossils are found during an extension that is being constructed on Hobbs End, a London underground station. And, but not only are strange fossils found, they also find a craft which the military thinks might be a Satan, ironically, an actual bomb that was used by the Nazis during World War II but turns out to actually be a Martian spacecraft. And Quatermass and his team find the pilots inside who turn out to be these locust-like creatures. And this is an image that haunted me from childhood when I saw the film on the Saturday afternoon creature feature when it was known as Five Million Years to Earth. And so the idea is that the Martians came to Earth, took prehistoric man back to their planet, altered them somehow, gave them cognitive abilities, including possibly psychic abilities, and brought them back to Earth as a kind of colony by proxy because Mars at that point was dying. So everything comes to a climax towards the end when a giant influx of energy comes into the ship, which by the way is covered in Kabbalistic symbols, ancient magic symbols, including a pentacle, and all of a sudden, a giant phantasm of energy streams up from the ship over London in the shape of these locust-like creatures. Now, the idea that Neil is playing with is that the devil is always in our subconscious and has come out through our art as symbols of these creatures who look like horned demons. So the horned demon, which we see in tribal masks drawn on cave walls, is in fact these sorts of demons. And so Professor Roney, the counterpart to Professor, Professor Quatermass, sacrifices himself by drawing a large crane made of iron into the creature, iron traditionally being the enemy of the devil, diffusing it into the ground. It's this spectacular scene which gets rid of the creature, which has basically turned man against man all over London. So the work that Neil did has always, to me, been fascinating because he took what was supernatural and tried to explain it in scientific terms. Um, Quatermass calls this phenomenon that were badly observed and could not otherwise be explained. And this is something that pops up in Neil's work elsewhere. The stone tape where ghosts turn out to be the energy remnants of people who have died in this location. And as mentioned, the original draft of Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, which basically crossed witchcraft with technology. And John Carpenter was so impressed by Neil's work, and he was so instrumental in his own work that he actually used the pen name Martin Quatermass when writing 1987's Prince of Darkness, which is itself Cross science fiction and horror to explain away Satan. I wonder. A name that's been nearly worn out before anything turned up to claim it. 
Was this really a Martian? Those are my six cinematic Satans. Let us know yours in the comments below. I'm Sean Plummer with Room Org Magazine, and you've been watching Room Org TV. We'll see you soon. Would you prefer to keep me to keep my hands still? No, no. Because it helps me. Really, uh, yeah, I see them more. All right. Hey. Oh.